Hello, in this video, I will be going over how a contractor can be prepared for a Perkrite drift dispersal installation. We'll look at a typical plan together, go over a list of materials that needs to be supplied by the contractor, and then look how some of those supplies will be implemented on the project. So first, let's take a look at a plan. Here is your typical drip dispersal plan. We have a home here with tanks and hydraulic unit behind the home, supply and return lines heading downhill to the drip dispersal field. Let's zoom in on the field. You notice that there is some grading that is taking place here, but overall the, the bed is laid parallel with the contour and the tubing will be laid parallel as well. Here is a page two of the drip dispersal plan. In the bottom corner here is your zone detail. This will explain how the manifold connections will be working, how long the runs are, and spacing. Let's zoom in on that. Here we go. Top feed manifold for a sloping site. Runs to be 44 feet long and two feet on center. And here is an additional detail to help show approximately at what elevation each run of tubing would need to be. In this profile, the designer is explaining what soil needs to be removed, how much Title V sand needs to be imported, where the drip tubing is going to be laid, and what type of cover material and how much is going to go on top. As part of the pre-planning process, Oakson will help you establish a list of materials that you as the contractor will need to supply for the project. Here is a typical list of materials for you know, any type of project. We'll need some one inch schedule 40 PVC pipe that is used for the supply and return lines that go from the hydraulic unit out to the drip dispersal field. We'll need some inch and a half schedule 40 pipe that is for the pump supply line and the gravity return that goes back to the inlet of the septic tank. Not on this list is half inch schedule 40 pipe. Um, that could be on there. If it's a top feed manifold, we'll need some of that. Uh, in this case, uh, it wasn't on there, but perhaps for your project it may be. Six inch SDR 35, we're gonna use that as part of the cool guide, which is the pump mounting mechanism, and we'll go over that in a little bit. We'll need some black arm reflex foam pipe wrap insulation. Now, I want to kind of uh, clarify that a little bit. When you buy this material, we need it for one inch PVC pipe. But on the box, it'll say for one inch pipe, but if you look real closely, it's one inch copper. Copper outside diameter is thinner than PVC. So you'll need to get one size larger than the one inch if you want it to wrap around the pipe properly. In addition to the armor flex insulation, we'll need a sheet of rigid one inch insulation board. We're gonna cut that up in strips to make a box to go over some of the riser pipes. Duct tape, PVC glue and primer, you know, pretty self-explanatory. We're gonna need some three quarter stone. Uh, we'll talk about where that goes and why it's used in a little bit. Um, a four by four by inch and a half T that's going to attach to the building sewer and we're going to run the gravity return line into that and I'll show you a picture in a little bit. We may need some concrete blocks like those 8x8x6 eight by eight by blocks. Uh, oftentimes if you have a pretty tall riser on top of your pump chamber we'll need to raise the hydraulic unit up so that we can access it at finished grade after backfill. Beside all these materials that you'll need to supply, here are some additional items that you should be ready for on the day of installation. All of the risers should be on the tanks. We will be securing pumps and brackets and whatnot to these and need to figure out what the finished grade is going to be around the tank to set the proper height for the hydraulic unit and it would be pretty difficult to do that without the risers on the tanks. We will need either concrete lags or some stainless screws to secure those brackets to the tank. So depending upon what type of riser you'll have, you know, have uh, the proper um, 
uh, attaching device ready. We'll need clean water for the pump chamber. Now, for existing homes, that shouldn't be a problem, but sometimes for new construction, the water service may not be on yet. So we may need to think about you know, running a hose to a neighbor's property or even perhaps getting a water truck to the site to fill up the pump chamber. Um, the amount of uh, water we need in there is usually about 24 to 30 inches of clean water, plenty to do the clean water startup. And lastly, and probably most importantly, to ensure a smooth day of installation is the electrician. You as the contractor will be hiring the electrician and we want to make sure they are there at the very start of the installation day. We can send out the control panel ahead of time so you can put it in their hands. Perhaps they may even decide to mount it on the building and run the feeds from the inside service out to the control panel. But more importantly, there will be some um, you know, junction boxes and connectors needed to, uh, to wire all of the Percray components. You know, in my experience, you know, sometimes an electrician gets a late start, uh, the contractor and the technician may be done with all of the other installation parts by say one o'clock and we're waiting a couple of hours for the electrician to finish. That's valuable time wasted because we could have uh, the Board of Health inspect the system, seeing it running, and perhaps even get it all backfilled the same day. So really important, please have the electrician there at the start of the day. Before the Oakson technician comes to the job site, you'll need to make sure that a few things are prepared. You know, the first and probably most obvious, all your tanks should be installed. If the drip dispersal tubing is going on a sand bed, you'll need to make sure that that sand bed is prepped in that it's all raked out to the elevation to where the tubing is to be laid. Here is a good depiction on, on a sloping site. You notice how the contours are very consistent from top to bottom and from left to right. So this is what you know, we expect the sand bed to look like prior to our arrival. Let's say you're not installing on a sand bed and it's going to be plowed into existing grade. You want to make sure you have the equipment ready. So here is a vibratory plow with a trenching attachment on the front. But most importantly, notice all of the paint marks. So the site contractor went and established what the contours were on the lawn and, and did, did paint lines. This makes it a lot easier to trench the tubing in because you know exactly where it needs to go. So off to the right of the picture, you can notice that already several lines have been pulled in. There's a little bit of disturbance there. You notice the pigtails of the tubing sticking up uh, on the far side of the picture. On the left side of the picture, there are more lines for future um, runs to be trenched in. Let's say it's a more uh, flat site and pretty consistent shape like a rectangle. Another way to prepare your lines would be to use flags. So you have a flag at one side of the field and a flag at the other side of the field and you're just going to pull straight along that path. So on the list of materials we talked about uh, a six inch piece of SDR 35. Here it is here and it's being glued to the cool guide. That's that uh, piece with the holes cut in the bottom. This device is going to be used as the pump mounting mechanism. The piece will be cut to length and it's going to be notched out, put into your tank, and you can see the pump lowered down into um, the, the 6 inch SDR. Um, also note that this piece that where, where the notch is needs to be secured to the riser. So you'll be supplying either concrete lags or stainless screws. In this case, the concrete lag was used because of the type of riser. Uh, and you'll also need to secure that float bracket with a few more of those screws that you can see here in the picture as well. Here is the black Armaflex insulation. So it's wrapped around the one inch pipe. You'll note that the force means are below frost where they elbow up to come through the frost zone is where we're gonna insulate it both with the Armaflex and then use that one inch rigid foam, cut strips and make a box. 
Here you can see that same armor flex installation used for the risers that go from the hydraulic unit down to the one inch supply and return lines. Also note that these the concrete blocks were needed to raise the hydraulic unit off of the pump chamber. Uh, the riser here is probably about three feet tall. So this hydraulic unit needs to be accessed from finished grade. The enclosure that it sits in is about 18 inches tall. So we need to make sure that that hydraulic unit is raised high enough so that when the box sits on top of it, it is at finished grade and accessible. On the list, we talked about a four by four by inch and a half T or Y to be used for the building sewer inlet. The gravity return line from the hydraulic unit needs to work its way back to the front of the septic tank. And we find that it's best that if it can be tied directly in to the four inch sewer line so that another knockout need not be put into the septic tank. You know, one less pipe penetration you know, means for a, a better chance for the tank to remain watertight throughout its life. You know, kind of here's a bird's eye view of a hydraulic unit that's suspended off a pump chamber with the blocks. You can see the cool guide notch and secure it to the riser. You can also see the four by four by inch and a half T and the gravity return line coming all the way down to that into the four inch pipe. Here is that enclosure we talked about. It's nicely lined up against the risers on the pump chamber and blocks were needed to slightly raise it off of the top of the tank. Also on the list, we call for a couple of five gallon buckets of three quarter stone. The stone is used to be placed around the base of this round enclosure. Inside that enclosure sits the air release valves for the supply and return manifolds. Now those air valves do spit out a little bit of water when they're evacuated in the air. So the stone is a means for the water to not be trapped inside that enclosure and potentially create a bathtub effect. So the stone will allow the water to dissipate out and have that um, round irrigation enclosure uh, always be empty. Having the electrician come to the site early in the day is really important because there will be some materials they'll need to provide to to hook up the pump and the floats back to the control panel. In this case they used a junction box with SO connectors. They may or may not have had that on their truck so they need to kind of see how the layout of our pump chamber is and get the proper materials accordingly to do their job. Sometimes we send the control panel out to the electrician ahead of time. In this case, there was some additional wiring inside the home needed to snake from the control panel over to the service of the home. Now that could take several hours and prolong the startup of the Perkwright system, so sometimes that is best served to be done uh, on the day prior to the Perkwright installation. Well, that concludes our video on how to be prepared for a Perkwright drip dispersal installation. I hope that you found it useful and informative. If you're looking for a more comprehensive and in-depth look at installation of Perkwright, feel free to browse our website. We have many other great videos on there. And in the meantime, we'll say goodbye and hopefully I'll see you soon at your next installation. Thank you.